Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you to our midweek video for this week. We appreciate you tuning in. If you haven't already done so, if you would consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell and becoming a part of our listening audience here on YouTube, Grace Life Bible, we would certainly appreciate that. You can stay current with the ministry. We go live from the Assembly Building on Sunday mornings, as well as when we create content for you here midweek. We would love to have you be a part of our audience. Also, I want to remind you about our Rumble channel here, Grace Life Bible Church on Rumble. We established this as an alt-text site. Should something happen to our YouTube ministry, so if you're into alt-text sites or would like an alternative to YouTube, please consider subscribing, checking us out here on Rumble as well. My featured book this week is, again, my book, J.C. O'Hare and the Origins of the American Grace Movement, 1899 through 1958. It's a co-authored book that I wrote with myself and my former professor, uh, Dr. Dale DeWitt. It's a full-length featured church history book about the origins of the American Grace Movement in the United States and the history of dispensationalism in our country as well. Also have a second book. It's my Rightly Dividing E.W. Bollinger, Assessing His Life, Ministry, and Impact. Again, covering the life and ministry of an important figure in the history of dispensationalism, and that would be E.W. Bollinger with a particular emphasis on focus on discerning when, how, where, and why Bollinger shifted from a mid-Acts dispensational view to an Acts 28 dispensational view. So if you're into the history of dispensationalism, or you like more about these important figures in the history of dispensationalism, please consider checking out the book on O'Hare as well as the book on Bollinger. There will be links in the descriptions for where you can order both. Those of you that have been following the channel of late, you know that midweek we've been interacting with the rise and fall of dispensationalism, this book right here, How the Evangelical Battle Over the End Times Shaped a Nation, and this is by Daniel G. Hummel. This came out in May of this year, 2023. So we've been interacting with this book. Last week there was not a video because I was on vacation the week previous and in Chicago at a Bible conference last week. So we did not, we're not able to get a video out last week. So I'd like to resume my normal recording schedule. Um, and so this video will be premiering this Thursday, assuming everything goes the way that it's supposed to. When we were last together in this series, I had given my thoughts on chapter two, um, American Mission Field, John Nelson Darby in America, Interpretive Innovations, Types and Antitypes at a Difficult Field, where we went through Hummel's assessment of Darby's coming to America ministry as he came to the United States. Where I want to pick this up in this episode is in chapter three, border state conversions. Okay. Now in this chapter, Hummel is going to kind of look at how two figures who lived in border states during the American Civil War adopted dispensational premillennialism and he's going to have some things to say about that. Now, it's not immediately apparent, but in each one of these chapters, there's the chapter, there's an introduction in each chapter, and then there's the various subsections, okay? Now, I'm just going to be upfront and above board on this. I'm probably going to focus more here on James H. Brooks in this episode than I am on Joseph A. Cease, or Sice Cease, not sure exact pronunciation there. Just because Brooks is more of an important figure as we move through uh, Hummel's book, um, and he's also, in my opinion, the more important figure just in the history of dispensationalism in the United States. So I'll mention some things about Cease, and then we'll move on, okay? So we're in Chapter 3, Border State Conversions, and I'm in the introduction to Chapter 3, okay? So from Darby's Journeys to Stanley's Prophetic Charts, now remember that was this chart right here, one of the first dispensational charts. This is his illustrative diagram by a Plymouth brethren in England known as Stanley, where he's trying to lay out an understanding of dispensational time, okay? So from Darby's journeys to Stanley's prophecy charts, brethren ideas flowed into the Great Lakes Basin. We talked about that last time when we looked at chapter two, okay? They were carried by paper and song, transmitted in Bible studies and personal encounters, the radical nature of these teachings and the various methods through which they were disseminated increased the diversity of their reception and adaptations by Americans. Okay, now again, notice that Hummel is saying that this the, that this was radical. Uh, he says the radical nature of their teachings. So he uh, is sort of 
at least suggesting that dispensational teaching was radical. It's carried along these different streams and accepted and adopted in varying degrees by Americans. We've talked about that already, that Americans uh, had an uneven adaptation of uh, Darby's ideas. The Brethren produced very few direct disciples, but they shaped a wider swath of American Christianity. So again, that's the idea that Americans did not necessarily embrace Plymouth Brethrenism, but they adopted Brethren ideas into their frameworks uh, and to varying degrees. Second paragraph of the introduction to chapter three, the logic of who selectively adopted Brethren teachings and when was complex, but one overriding factor was that both Brethren evangelization and American ed adoption were taking place in the years surrounding the American Civil War, okay? So Darby first comes to the United States in 1861, I believe, right around the time that war is breaking out or getting ready to break out. The experience, now here we go again, the experience of white evangelicals in border states in particular proved to be a fertile ground for brethren reception. The trauma of war made Americans in border states allergic to overtly nationalist conceptions of the church. It's an interesting statement. This aversion, this aversion was carried into the era of Reconstruction when border state Christians became some of the loudest proponents of sectional reconciliation between Northern and Southern whites. So Hummel is going to frame this all up now in this, this post-Civil War reconciliation uh, mindset. Not Reconstruction, but reconciliation between Northern and southern whites and so he's going to look in this chapter at two people along the border during the american civil war in border states that adopted dispensational truth or premillennial uh, theology to differing degrees by 1870 the outlines of a new radical subculture emerged that combined the uh, priority of sectional reconciliation with key brethren teachings about the heavenly nature of the church and the preliminary premillennial arrival of the kingdom of God. So again, this is being conceived by Hummel in a social framework, okay? And he's going to look at the reception of this Darbyite dispensational concepts in this social framework that is uh, set forth in the backdrop of the Civil War. These radicals, so he's calling these people that adopt these Darbyite ideas radicals. These radicals created a new interpretive community, first in the border states and then beyond, which in its own way, uh, with its own ways of talking about Bible, salvation, the church, prophecies, and the future, they ditched the old premillennial methods of date setting, making a break with the longstanding premillennial tradition in America. We talked about old premillennialism versus new premillennialism in, in a prior episode, okay? They also rejected key aspects of Brethren teachings, including anti-clericism. Most of the early new premillennials were professional pastors. So again, that's that idea that Darby chafed against, that the Amer he could not get the American converts to his ideas to leave their denominations, which for Darby was a big deal uh, as, an, as a um, protester, if you will, of the denominational structures of the Church of England. Ecclesiastical separation, most remain in their denominations, like I just said, and the Brethren resistance to the holiness movement, most embrace these teachings. Alternatively, they offered a new hermeneutic for reading the Bible's prophetic passages that center on a dualism between Israel and the church, producing an intricate scenario of the coming plans of world redemption and a narrower heavenly mandate for the contemporary church. The new premillennial teachings per, uh, privileged civil peace over racial justice since the former facilitated the ability for global witness that drew from the full resources of American Protestant churches. So the priority is civil peace over racial justice as the way Hummel is framing this. White Christian unity, in other words, would be more would more ably repair the damage wrought by the Civil War and empower the project of global missions. So what Hummel's doing is he's laying out an interpretive framework now that is saying that the priority is in mission work and civil peace to facilitate mission work. And so these people are adopting pre dispensational premillennialism because it is 
facilitates their goals and aims after the Civil War. So you, you, you really have to listen and pay attention. But what he's saying essentially is that people are adopting these ideas because they fit their pol their politics more so than they're adopting them because they believe they're biblically true. Okay, and that to me is a major issue here as we work our way through this material. Two pastors with backgrounds in border states, James Hall Brooks in Missouri and Joseph A. Cease, Sice, I can't, I'm not sure, from Maryland, spearheaded new premillennial thinking and soon spread throughout the religious networks of the North. Brooks, a Presbyterian pastor in St. Louis, was, attra was attracted to brethren teachings by way of concern of his local church and denomination. So what Hummel is saying is that Brooks is attracted to dispensational teaching through his experiences in his local church and his broader denomination, okay? Cease, a Lutheran from Maryland who pastored the largest Lutheran congregation in the, in the, count, in the country in Philadelphia, was more fixated on the moral and prophetic significance of the Civil War. They adopted brethren teachings for different theological motives. Brooks through a concern for church and Cease through a concern for the future. Both also became prolific boosters of post-Civil War reconciliation between white Americans. Darby's teachings were unexpectedly suited for a time of Civil War. So this is the framework that Hummel is, go is, is, is choosing to discuss the story, okay? And while, yeah, there were some theological considerations they are cast primarily within the backdrop of us of social concerns and greater mission activity okay now the next subsection you can see right here james h brooks and the church james h brooks and the church so he goes through the history of brooks i will read some of this probably not every word uh, of it but uh, in talking about brooks he says um, yet he did not become attracted to brother in teaching until he was a seasoned pastor. And even then, his interest in new premillennial premillennialism was not was not focused on the end times as such, but on the way the new teaching recontextualized the church as a heavenly community to a pastor who was seemingly forced into taking positions on such earthly concerns as slavery and secession, the church as a heavenly body, the church as a heaven bound body was especially attractive. So, what Hummel is again saying is that Brooks is attracted to this because of what he's going through uh, in, ha in a border state, born and raised in the South, now pastoring in a border state, Missouri, during the Civil War. And he's attracted to dispensational premillennialism because of, as it says here, it conceived of the church as a heaven-bound body and uh, therefore was especially attractive. So it allowed him to, according to Hummel, ap to approach ministry from a different framework that was well-suited for his position. Now, there might be some truth to that. My problem with it is, is it, it diminishes the fact of whether or not Brooks actually believed dispensational premillennialism on its own merits and for its own reasons as a way of interpreting and understanding the Bible. It's casting the social concern, the social political concerns as higher than the theological, biblical, or interpretive concerns or the advantages of dispensational premillennialism that Brooks might have had or understood or seen theologically, okay? Next paragraph, second paragraph of this subsection, as a convert to premillennialism in the 1860s, Brooks typified a wider shift in American attitudes that helped to break up the widely shattered expectation that America would usher in God's kingdom. So that would be postmillennialism. For all the violent disagreements between Northerners and Southerners over slavery, slavery Americans tended to agree on this postmillennial perspective on a type of lockstep progressive march of the church and nation that idealized their unity and continuity. For centuries, such confidence was supported by a shared post-millennial reading of the Bible. There were dissenters, of course, and differences of opinion within this post-millennial consensus, but most Americans assented in spirit, if not in mind, to the words of Jonathan Edwards, 
who was sure in 1742 that the latter day glory is likely to begin in America. So what, and I do think Hummel's right about this, the predominant view amongst American Christianity was a post-millennialism. The idea that America is going to usher in the kingdom. You know, this goes back to the, the famous city on a hill uh, address that was given by the Pilgrim Fathers, etc. Okay, there's this idea amongst a lot of Americans that this is the this is the sort of the God given birthright of the nation, if you will, to usher in this this kingdom age. The days of post millennial consensus ended in the 1860s. The Civil War's violence and destruction helped shatter the image of the United States as the vanguard of the coming kingdom. But this was just the initial shock. Now, I think he's probably right about that. I think the Civil War and the cleavage of the nation that occurred during that time probably did a lot to um, cause people to reconsider, reconsider, rethink post-millennial theology. Okay? He says there's more, though. Higher criticism of the Bible and Darwinian evolution to academic discourses that permeated seminaries and universities after the war began to unrival, unravel excuse me, the biblical case for post-millennialism. While nascent social gospel movement that applied Christian ethics to social problems saw the kingdom of God as righting the wrongs of industrialization, premillennialists regarded correcting modern social ills as too difficult an endeavor, in any case, and a secondary task to evangelization. So, <laughs> Premillennialists said the issue is the gospel. The issue is justification. The issue is seeing men saved, not rescuing the social structures of the country. So this becomes a driving force of American premillennialism because premillennialists understand that this world is not getting better and better. This world is getting worse and worse. And the only hope and prayer that this world has is the second coming of Jesus Christ to overthrow all things that offend and establish a kingdom on earth. Premillennialism. Okay. So now that, that, that doctrinal understanding affects how they look at society, socially, etc. In my mind, not the other way around. Now that doesn't mean there weren't people that came from it from the other side, but Premillennialism is primarily concerned with understanding that the only hope and prayer that this world has is the second coming of Christ back to this planet to establish a kingdom on the earth and establish his own rule. No region of the United States felt the cross currents of sectional strife as powerfully as the border states that included Missouri. As the country divided over slavery, border communities understood themselves to occupy a neutral position, a neutral political position that combine Southern cultural sympathies and legal chattel slavery with the desire to avoid succession. For those Americans shaped by this border state culture, a stark separation between church and state became the cherished ideal to maintain neutrality. On the western edge of the border region in the nation's fourth largest city of St. Louis, the ideal was put to a strenuous test, okay? So understand all, all that he's saying there. The concerns of border states were particularly unique compared to clear states that had aligned with the Confederacy versus clear states that were aligned with the Union. The border states were a mixture, as I'll read it again, uh, they combined cult, Southern cultural sympathies and legal chattel slavery with desire to avoid succession. So you had both forces in these border states. Enter James Hall Brooks, Brooks, born in Pulaski, Tennessee in 1830, the son of a Presbyterian minister who died from cholera in 1833. Brooks's family was poor and James worked as a farmhand clerk and teacher before the age of 18. He enrolled in Miami University, Ohio, United Presbyterian Seminary, Virginia, and finally Princeton Seminary, New Jersey, before being ordained a Presbyterian minister in 1854. Brooks was, in the words of his son-in-law, a southerner born and bred, but also a creature of the border region. After a first pastorate in Dayton, Ohio, Brooks moved to St. Louis in 1858, where he would live the rest of his life. 
Though poor, the Brooks family continued to employ at least one African American servant when James was a young man. Uh, while personally opposed to the institution of slavery, Brooks never agitated against it. So he didn't like it personally. He was against it, but he was never public about it, is what Hummel is getting at. The old school Presbyterian statement of 1845, which refused to render judgment on slavery at all, being his guiding light to the question, do the scriptures teach that the holding of slaves without regard to circumstances is a sin, the renunciation of which should be made a condition of membership in the Church of Christ. The General Assembly refused to answer definitively. So Brooks as a Presbyterian is holding to this, this Presbyterian sort of viewpoint from 1845. Okay, While not to be understood as denying that there is evil connected with slavery, the statement refrained from attaching the word sin to slave ownership, which would have required church discipline. Since Christ, since Christ and his inspired apostles did not make the holding of slaves a bar to communion, we, as a court of Christ, have no authority to do so, the assembly decided. And again, they're deciding that in 1845. The years following 1845 only cemented Brooks's conviction that the church should remain silent on slavery. From St. Louis, he, he propounded the doctrine of the spirituality of the church, teaching that the true church was a spiritual community with heavenly citizenship. This view held clear political implications. Namely, it made the status quo acceptable. Now, I just want to say, I don't, maybe it did at that time, but I think you can adopt a, a very high view of the earthly future and destiny and hope of the church and still be, and still be willing to recognize there are certain things that are just wrong. Uh, biblically speaking, okay, credited more prominently to credited most prominently to the Southern Carolina Presbyterian pastor and theologian James Henry Thornwell, the spirituality of the church was deeply appealing to Southern Presbyterians in the lead up to the Civil War. Quote: While scriptures are silent, she, the church, must be silent too. Thornwell wrote in 1850. Accordingly, slavery was a political issue, not a spiritual issue due to the Bible's lack of an explicit condemnation. So this is the, the this is the thinking now that is going on before the outbreak of war. It is hard to see the spirituality of the church as taught by Thornwell as a fig leaf for the perpetuation of slavery, especially as Thornwell himself, after Lincoln's election in 1860, advocated for the secession of his own state and became a leading architect of the Presbyterian Church in the Confederate States of America before his death in 1862. Thornwell then cast away entirely his non-political veneer um, designating chattel slavery as a key to maintaining social order. So what Hummel's saying there is this guy wants the war, wants the war sort of when push comes to shove during the war, this guy comes out and says that that, that you know there's nothing scripturally or biblically wrong with chattel slavery, okay? Now, if you're just jumping into this video, remember I'm reading from a book here, okay? Brooks may have been a Southerner by birth and culture, but he was against secession. His sympathies were with his friends in the South, but he thought their course of action ruinous. His son-in-law explained, since secession constituted Brooks's breaking point with Southern Presbyterians, it is unsurprising that Thornwall's name hardly appears in Brooks's writings. Antebellum politics and denominational infighting produced a particularly Presbyterian spirituality of the church that was alluring to those seeking neutrality during the war. Border state Presbyterians like Brooks, however, continued the tradition after Thornwell and Southern Presbyterians abandoned it to become Confederate partisans. So there's a Look, I do think at some level we have to recognize that there's a political social uh, milieu going on here that these guys are living in that they cannot be divorced from as they're trying to think through how they're going to handle all these things and how all of these things that are occurring are going to affect them, impact them, not only personally, but also in their ministries. Brooks arrived at Second Presbyterian Church in St. Louis in 1858, perhaps briefly overlapping with James Ingle's stint in the city though there is no evidence that they met at this time. 
Brooks's resignation after six years and then appointment to nearby Walnut Street Presbyterian Church in the summer of 1864 was due to his unwavering neutrality during the war. So it becomes apparent that Brooks can no longer minister in one church because he is remaining neutral on his position on the war. He's in a border state. He's trying to remain neutral. Um, congregational strife at Second Presbyterian Church came to a head after elders voiced dismay that Brooks, that Brooks refused to publicly pray for the success of the Union Army. Brooks resigned on July 3rd, 1864, but the following day, more than 100 parishioners who also believed in neutrality left to organize the Walnut Street Presbyterian Church. Brooks immediately accepted the invitation to the new pulpit and delivered his first sermon on July 9, a <clears throat> uh, proptorious and probably coordinated set of events for the 34-year-old pastor. So he's forced out of one church because he's not, he's neutral, he's not political enough. And so he then is going to go f within a week, basically establish a new church still in the Presbyterian denomination. Pressure to abandon neutrality increased during Reconstruction, in many ways outpacing the same pressure during wartime. Brooks signed an 1865 declaration and testimony protesting his denomination's conduct during the war. As with secession and schism, the General Assembly, too, sinned in joining the war effort. The fate of slavery was sealed, but Brooks still pined for the ideal of the 1845 settlement, signaling his willingness to join a short-lived independent Missouri synod of Presbyterian Church beholden to neither North nor South denominational leadership. Brooks lambasted the General Assembly at its 1866 annual meeting, <coughs> As he attempted another war in defense of the 1845 statement, he insisted that moving forward, the questions surrounding slavery be put to rest for the sake of spiritual purity and civil peace. Uh, uh, as the applause in the chamber made clear, Brooks channeled the feelings of a large swath of white Missourians. His stridency was shown in St. Louis, where he pastored congregants whose wartime identification with one side or the other, or insufficient support of either side, now threaten their church standing. So this is stuff that we have no, we we today have no identification with this type of thing, okay? Where the, the war has created such a cleavage in the country, in families, in churches, that this is all now being sorted out after after the war is over and things are, are, are trying to, you know, fall back into place uh, after the war. In subsequent years, Brooke relentlessly called for reconciliation throughout the state. <clears throat> okay, and then moving on to the theological stuff here. Brooks traveled the theological road to premillennialism by the root of his concern for church neutrality. So here's what he's saying. He's saying, what Hummel's saying is that Brooks's political social concerns are his main route into premillennial truth. With the backdrop of what we've just said. The premillennial truth was a teaching that he later recalled during his first years of ministry had never occupied my attention. Okay. His new beliefs became evident in the late 1860s with his major premillennial announcement coming in 1875 with the launch of his premillennial journal, The Truth. But Brooks did not narrate his conversion to premillennialism in terms of border straight neutrality. So in other words, when he explains why he's becoming a premillennial, a dispensational premillennialist, it's not because of these social political factors that Hummel's talking about. His own account focused on intense Bible reading and individual uh, conversation of the head and heart. He credited no outside source, no single human book or comment, no exposition of any sort, save his own unique method of study, with a, with a lead pencil in hand, he marked every passage that he deemed relevant to the future of the church and the world, and having gathered up the marked passages and brought them together, he concluded that Jesus would return bodily to inaugurate the millennial kingdom. So when Brooks talks about how he converted to dispensational premillennialism, it has nothing to do with the social political concerns that Hummel's talking about. It's theological. It's, it's, it's his own Bible study is leading him to these conclusions. Accepting Brooks's account at face value, 
that the Bible reading method led to his premillennial conversion, we cannot rule out the role of other factors that may have played. So it can't be as simple as what Brooks said. It's got to be all this other stuff too. His views bore the distinct marks of Darby, who first visited St. Louis in 1862, then again in 1872 and 1875. Darby commented on the success he was having in the city, though never with names. One later account of the brethren claimed that Darby preached in Brooks's pulpit, though there is not a primary source to verify. The extent of Darby's direct influence on Brooks is unclear. Certainly, Brooks's own Presbyterian denomination had as much to do with the spirituality of the church as did Darby's dualism, especially before the Civil War. But Brooks adopted numerous aspects of Darby's thought that bolstered the spirituality of the church with premillennialism emerging as the larger edifice of his post-Civil post War theology. Brooks began to write of the two peoples of God, Israel and the church, and the earthly mission of Israel as recorded in the Old Testament and the church's heavenly vocation as spelled out in the New. In the one, therefore, Brooks concluded, of the two halves of the Bible, Israel received an earthly calling, but in the other, the church has a heavenly calling. While Brooks championed plain reading of scripture, especially of prophecy, he also adopted a typological logic, the typological logic of Darby. On the subject of humanity's judgment, Brooks taught typologies that made sense only through the lens of brethren teaching. Okay, we might argue for analogy that a heavenly people, the church, would be preserved from judgment like Enoch, and then an earthly people, the faithful remnant among the Israelites, would be preserved through it like Noah, while the ungodly who have despised his love would be overwhelmed, would be overwhelmed by it like the antediluvian world. These analysis of three categories of humanity mirrored line for line Darby's commentary of his popular synopsis of the books of the Bible. Okay. Moreover, in the 1860s, Brooks became a champion of the new premillennialism. So, excuse me. Over the 1860s, Brooks became a champion of the new premillennialism. Maranatha, 1874, a 500-page treatise that he later described as this little volume to the truth of his premillennial return signaled a new era in American premillennialism when it appeared. Brooks cited warmly the non-Millerite old premillennialists of prior decades and situated his conversion among the major theological and biblical minds of the 19th century, all while making a case for a novel understanding of many of the details. Only once in Maranatha did Brooks mention Darby, whose English rendering of the rapture, on pay, uh, rapture passage on 1 Thessalonians 4, 14-18 was Brooks' preferred version. But acknowledgment came in many other forms. Brooks highlighted the brethren theologian William Craig Baines of McGill University in his division of dispensations and made scattered references to exclusive brethren, including C.H. McIntosh. He prioritized his needs as a, now watch, he prioritized his needs as a border state evangelical to mix and match. Brooks's eclecticism had clear brother influence, appealing to the survivors of an American civil war who were grappling with the legacy of neutrality and dim prospects of sectional reconciliation. So Hummel is, is, is casting this again in this social political framework, okay? Now, let me just say, I don't doubt that Brooks had it rough. I mean, imagine being run out of one church because you weren't being political enough for some people and too political for others by not being political. And so Brooks definitely has a unique set of circumstances that he's trying to deal with. What I'm questioning from Hummel's interpretive grid is to what extent Hummel's putting a lot of stock in the political social aspect and not as much in my mind in the theological aspect of this. I th to what extent did these men adopt dispensational premillennialism because they were convinced theologically from the Bible that it was true, okay, not simply to adopt, not simply to facilitate their social political goals, okay? Now, one thing that uh, you, you can't see because we've exhausted this is Brooks does have, and Hummel makes a comparison. So here is Stanley's 
um, dispensational timeline from the 1850s, his illustrative diagram. I showed this in a, in a previous episode. And here's Brooks's Maranatha. Now you'll notice his illustrative diagram. It is extremely similar to Stanley's. It is not hard to conclude that Stanley here and the Plymouth Brethren are influencing what are influencing what Brooks is doing here. Now he makes some adaptations. Notice what he says. This simple diagram suggested by an English tract may assist the reader in fixing and retaining the order of events as presented in the previous discussion. So here is a rudimentary dispensational chart to try to um, visually represent what the, the biblical understanding that has been presented has been, and notice how much it has in common with what Stanley had done. So there is no doubt that these Plymouth Brethren, etc., have been influencing um, Darby. I'm sorry, Brooks. Now, from page 58 all the way through page uh, 63, Hummel covers Cease or Sice and 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 his conversion to um, a premillennial dispensationalism and. Uh, he he does it uh, within the framework of Maryland and within the Lutheran Church, and he gives some uh, analysis along those lines. I'm not going to read all of that. This video has already been long enough, and I think in my judgment that Brooks is the more prominent, important figure. Um, but if you get the book, you're definitely going to want to read this as he lays out uh, in another example how Sice or Cease came to dispensational premillennialism. So where I want to go in ending this is to this, a wider interpretive community, okay? And we want to basically read from the last paragraph of the chapter on page, uh, we'll read some from page 64 and some from page 65. He says at the bottom of 64, for both James Brooks and, and Joseph Cease, converting to new premillennialism when they did, where they did, redirected their careers and their ministries in new directions as they channeled once obscure brother and voices into American evangelicalism. And then the final paragraph of the chapter, the new premillennial conversions of Brooks and Cease and Graves, another name he mentions just briefly, that would be uh, James Robinson Graves uh, from Nashville, Tennessee, the premillennial conversions of Brooks and Cease and Graves took place in the shadow of the Civil War and Reconstruction. And reconciling with the seismic changes to American society wrought by the war, each man embraced already circulating brethren teachings that made sense of his particular sectional and denominational setting. So, again, the, the sectional denominational setting is more prominent than the biblical teaching and, and interpretive grid, okay? Each man embraced already circulating brethren teachings that made sense of his particular sectional and denominational setting. There was no single pathway into new, new premillennialism. No one argument or doctrine that immediately resonated with a wide swath of Americans, and the growth of this new interpretive community was slower but stronger because of it. The, mul the multiplicity of new premillennialism's appeal would advance along the trajectories set by these first American converts, okay? And as you can see, we're going to get into his explanation of that in chapter four when we look at numbers and structures. Now, before I go, a couple things. I want to remind you, you need to be going through the essential Darby playlist here. OK, it lays out a lot of ground here for Darby's conversion, his understanding of dispensational truth, his understanding of the rapture, his dispensational scheme, and then ultimately coming to America here. So I will leave a link in the description for this particular playlist. OK, the other thing I want to announce is that we are having a Bible conference at Grace Life Bible Church that I would like to invite you to. Our Bible conference is October 20, 21, and 22 at Grace Life Bible Church, and our theme this year is Leading a Quiet and Peaceable Life in a World Gone Crazy. Our speakers are David Reed, Matt Hawley, and myself, and we, over the weekend, three days, have a series of teachings for you. Friday, October 20, 
We're starting with nationalism versus globalism, the great struggle of our time. We're going to have dominion theology, a, a scriptural evaluation of post-millennial theology, just like what we were talking about here today. Saturday morning, we have the Sermon on the Mount and Progressive Christianity. At 1015, we have Awake Thou That Sleepest, The Wokeism That Matters, a play on Ephesians 5 there, providing for one's own, the believer in the workplace. And then in the evening on Saturday, we have Prepping, Media, and Scripture, Assessing the Battle for Your Family. And then we do have a concert. It's, we need to amend this. There's a concert and an ice cream fellowship on Saturday night. And then we have two studies on Sunday morning, followed by lunch provided by the church. We have politics, prison, and Paul, cultural, civic engagement, and scripture. And then we have the quiet and peaceable life in a world gone crazy by Brother Dave Reed. So we invite you to come be a part of the Bible conference. We'd love to have you make plans and be a part of it. If you have any questions or would like a recommendation for housing, please let us know. And be advised also that there will be no children's classes on Friday or Saturday. The kids will have their normal class on Sunday morning. So let us know if you have any questions or have any interest in attending the Bible conference. And lastly, and most importantly, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, if you've never relied exclusively on his shed blood for you on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, as the only total complete payment for your sin, you need to trust Jesus Christ today before it's everlasting too late. God loves you. Christ died for your sin. He was buried and he rose again. Stop relying in your church attendance, your religious effort, your performance, your law keeping, your ability to try to make yourself right before God. You can't do it. Your best effort on your best day in your best suit of clothes will leave you short of the glory of God. The only thing that God will accept is perfect righteousness and that has been made available to us freely through the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves you. He sent a son to God loves you. He sent a son to die on the cross for your sin, shed his blood, believe and trust in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ as the only payment for your sin before it's everlasting too late. Thanks for your attention, and we'll see you next time.